Welcome everyone, Jonathan Troen here with another edition of Shared Humanity, a part of the self-love revolution. Today, Maggie Cook is with us. And I usually don't read people's bios before I introduce them and talk about them. Um, and I'm not gonna read the whole bio, but Maggie is one of the most amazing people I have ever, ever met. Noble Entrepreneurial Prize in Mexico, Small Business Administration Young Entrepreneur of the Year Award, Hall of Fame at the University of Charleston Award, author of Mindful Success, How to Use Your Mind to Transform Your Life. And you don't know how this all started yet. So this is a story of being homeless and becoming a millionaire and inspiring millions of people, including me, in the process. So uh, start us off, bring us, can you bring us back to the beginning, Maggie, in Mexico? Yes, absolutely. So I was uh, born in the central mountains of Mexico in Michoacan. And I was born and raised at an orphanage in the middle of the woods. <laughs> and I have 68 siblings. And our caregivers brought in over 200 other kids that live with us. So it was just two caregivers and all of us kids. And we basically grew each other up. When I was young, I was paired up with a young adult. And then when I was a young adult, I was paired up with a small child. And we sort of grew each other up like that. So what what is it like to be young and... You know, there are children with, with large families, but th this is a totally different experience. An orphanage, they're not really your parents, it's two people with 200 um, other children. What's it like to grow up in that kind of an environment? Well, I, I, I guess I thought it was normal, but <laughs> when I moved to America, I, I completely saw that it was unheard of and a normal family was a father and mother and a couple of kids or several kids. But um, certainly the things that I learned, I learned a lot uh, by watching, seeing people's mistakes. And one of the things that I know is, I, you know, you should never have that many kids unless you have adult responsibility. But uh, for each one of those kids, uh, and so we, uh, we grew up and we had a lot of... Uh, hardships and one of those were uh, was being hungry for up to two to three weeks because we didn't have food so I became a hunter as a matter of fact I, I think I showed you this is my original knife that I used to hunt with and um, and so being in an environment like that also you know with with two caregivers there's a lot of abuse uh, mental physical uh, to the point that I think they try to do the best that they could but if you can imagine having, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20 kids pulling at your dress saying, I want something, I want something, someone could go crazy. And I saw that a lot. And so it was certainly very difficult. It was an environment of fear. At times, I felt like I was going to die, I could die at any point. And so I sort of started on a journey of becoming a dreamer. Since I was five years old, I would dream that I was this person that was a superhero and I would go off to the woods and dream uh, or I, you know, I dug a cave in the side of a, a canyon and it was my secret hiding place for peace until I heard my name called from the orphanage, Maggie, some, you know, mom or dad wants you. And oh my gosh, that was when the fear would kick in because you never knew what was going to happen. Um, and the thing that I want to clarify too, is that I'm one of eight biological kids of theirs and we suffered more and it's one of the reasons why we're so close today because I heard him talking to my mom one day walking into the kitchen where he was saying that we sh that we should not pay attention to our biological kids because they're afraid I'm afraid that our adopted kids are going to feel bad or less of and are going to run away and so it was much tougher for us in terms of even being believed about things that were going on. 
and and certain disciplines and and it was very very a fearful and, and frustrating environment to to grow up in but somehow I had this hope and I was always using my mind to think and dream myself as a free person as a successful woman with long hair with you know heels and a suit behind a mahogany desk and I'm successful now and I can see myself and it was you know my happiness my my moment and the thing that I realized is that fear and love cannot coexist at the same time in the body so you either pick one or the other and that what you feed is what becomes stronger and it's a choice I really believe it's a choice and that's the choice that we all have every single morning when we wake up and so, what well, well, like so I, I've I've learned this in my in my older years um I, I I've learned you know thoughts become things and and, and you can vision but how, but I was, I was taught that I wasn't taught it when I was young, but eventually, you know, I came to someone and said, Hey, you know, you, you can change the way you think, but you figured it out on your own as a child. How did you do that? I really believe that we're all spiritually connected to something greater than us that we still might not even be able to understand or fathom. And just from the sheer uh, purpose of feeling better in my mind of having hope of, of ending my suffering, I visualized and I wrote goals of what I wanted to become. And I would meditate without knowing that I was meditating in my cave and I would see the future as, I'd, as it, it, it has become, except for I didn't know I was going to be a salsa maker, right? <laughs> I just knew that I was going to be successful in life. And I, I just couldn't wait every single day. I couldn't wait to get there, even though I was in that place for 18 years of my life. And it almost felt like there's no choice, you know, but here and now. But I always had my mind to kind of free myself from from the 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 pain, it was mental pain of, of not knowing what's going to happen next, if I was going to survive next. There's so many questions to ask, and I want to talk about the salsa, um, and, and I want to talk about like 18 and then what happened, but you kind of glossed over this part, and to me, it is, it, and because I know you shared it with me before, you dug a cave yes. outside <laughs> of the orphanage share that part of the story that that I mean that takes courage to, to leave the orphanage and dig your own cave um, share that so first of all for all, all your listeners if you go to go maggie.com it's go maggie with one g.com you can see the story video the cave is there and it was basically uh, it, it was about a meter maybe less than a meter tall and, and but it was round the entry part and it was about five or six meters, about two meters in and then to the right, another three meters or so. And it was built in the orphanage because there it was a mountainous area and it was built on a canyon. And I made it purposely. I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Shaw Shawshank Redemption, but I took little bits of dirt and spread them out in bags because I didn't want people to see like a huge carving out, coming out of the mountain and find my cave. But it was really hard to get to. You had to hold on to, you had to, it was like a drop uh, the size of a football field, like a drop. And you had to kind of hold on to roots of trees and things like that to get to it. Uh, it was a teeny tiny pathway. And I had this, this rope that I, uh, that I attached to a root inside of it, attached to a tree outside of it, because I, I never knew if it was going to collapse on me. It, that was my way out. To, to, to have that. So that's basically, and I had a teeny tiny lamp in there. <laughs> what, what, what kind of a lamp? It, you know, I don't know if, well, in Mexico, you had these uh, huge, like, I would say five by six or five by eight square, huge batteries with a, with a teeny tiny light that you would just switch the light. But it, it almost looks like, um, like a camping light, but it isn't. It's different very heavy duty, something that I found a long time ago, and I, I would just put it in there. But the, the interesting thing was when I 
was growing up, we didn't have access to food. So when I would go into the woods and find my own food, I would go into the cave and save it there to eat it later when I would get hungry. But then when I wasn't there, the animals started eating my food because there was a little teeth bite on my food. So I had this idea of carving little holes on the walls of the cave and bringing water and making mud pies and putting my food in and patching it and putting X's so that when I was hungry, I would just carve the X out and bring, <laughs> bring my food out. Like it, it, <laughs> the ability to think that way, just uh, it, I have to, I have to be honest, like it, it, it amazes me. What, how, how long would you spend in the cave? Would you, like, would you spend hours there? Like what, what was it like in there? Sometimes I, I would sleep in there and sometimes I would just spend hours in a day in there. And this is where you learned to meditate even though you didn't know you were meditating. Right. Yes. Right. And it's interesting because my caregivers were calling one day and they sent all the boys to look for me because they couldn't find me. And one of my brothers that I used to like compete with, his name was Julio. He found my cave and I was inside and I could see him like touching the bottom of the, like the patting the ground saying, Maggie, Maggie, are you in here? And he was so afraid of going in and I was laughing so hard inside because he was so afraid of going in that cave because he didn't know what it was in there, but it was my, my space. So yeah, it, it was, uh, it, it, I loved it. I, I loved, that was my secret, secret place of peace that I in, had. In this cave, it sounds like um, it gave you the tools for you to accomplish the things that you accomplished later in life. Is that, is that true? Yes, I, I feel like, you know, when people talk about grounding, going outside and wearing no shoes, and I felt like that was the deepest possible grounding that I could do because I didn't have shoes and I was inside uh, the earth in this cave and I f it felt so good. I don't know if you've ever been to like a cave or a mine or anything and you go in there and it just seems like so peaceful in the space there. I, I can't describe it unless you've experienced that. But it was so wonderful. So, so you have your cave, you're growing up in this orphanage, and then it's you're 18 years old. So yes. what happens then? So when I was, you know, since junior high and high school, because we went to school from first to uh, sixth grade at the orphanage, we started going to school in a nearby town. It was about 45 minutes to get there. And I was always thinking, what can I do? What can I be good at? to find my way out, like my ticket out. And obviously there were sports and I played sports. I played soccer and I played other things, but in, in junior high, this new sport became available was basketball in Mexico's huge on soccer, but you know, and so one day I was passing my principal's office and he had a teeny tiny black and white TV. One of those really old ones that was really long. And I saw Michael Jordan play and I was like, Oh my gosh, what is that? And I asked him if I could come in and watch that every single day during my breaks. And he said, yeah. So that's how I learned how to dribble, how to, you know, dribble the ball between my legs, behind my back, shoot free throws, do layups, everything. So I taught myself basketball and then I started, um, I got a basketball somehow. I don't remember how. And then I did a little court at the orphanage. It was made out of, you know, it's just dirt, flat ground and a little hoop. And I started to play. And I became so good because I figured out ways to unconventional ways to become better as a, a sports person. And I would practice four to six hours a day. And uh, you know how, remember how I was telling you that we were paired up with a younger kid when we were older? Well, one week I had this aha moment when I had uh, to care for an orphan kid. His name was Pancho and he had spinal bifida, so he couldn't walk. So I had to carry him in my back. And he's one of the kids that we found, uh, our caregivers found in a dumpster because he wasn't wanted. So I had to carry him and I had this light bulb idea. And I said, Pancho, what if, you know, I close my eyes with this rag and you tell me when I get to the edge of, of this, this square, you tell me, stop, turn, stop, turn. And so that's how I learned how to dribble without seeing the ball. And, and I was imagining people coming at me, like trying to take the ball. And I was drilling behind the legs, behind the back and all, and all these things. 
And at one point he saw, he, he thought that I was looking and I ran into the pole and I had to have, have stitches on my forehead. <laughs> <laughs> but that's how I got so good. And then in high school, um, we won every championship in uh, the Mexican national team was scouting and they saw me play and they asked me to come to play for the Mexican national team in Mexico city. And I still have the invitation letter that that letter is in that video that I mentioned earlier, uh, go And uh, so I, I got this invitation and I went to Mexico city with my caregiver and he, we were so excited and they said, yes, we're going to call you. We're going to call you because we're so interested. We went back to the orphanage and a month went by two, then three, we didn't get any calls. And then one day um, our father pulls up on an American football. We've never seen any, anything like it. And he teaches us how to throw it. And so we started to play. And uh, of course, me and Julio, Julio was the, the, the alpha guy, right? And, and he throws this really long pass and I run for it and run for it. And I, and I jump and I catch it in the air. It was beautiful. But then I land on my shoulder and I break my collarbone and my, and, and I went to my caregiver and he was a doctor also. And he took my shoulders and stretched them back. He like pulled me back and he saw what I'd done. And he told me your dreams are over. And because he, I guess from his doctor expert, expertise and the, the, the saddest thing for me was I was devastated, but three days later, the Mexican national team called and I couldn't go. Mm. But then I started thinking and meditating about the fact that this has got to be something, a sign or something. There's got to be something better. Maybe this is not the path that I'm supposed to be going. So I was still hopeful. You know, I was still hopeful and I was still believing that there's something better. There's always something better. And uh, about four to six months later, I can't remember exactly the time frame, but it was coming to the summer and our caregivers took a bus, like a school bus, and they took us all 68 of the kids to tour the United States to raise funds for the orphanage. And we got invited to a picnic in West Virginia. And the first thing that happened when we arrived there, it was at a Catholic school. There was an outdoor uh, basketball court and I saw a ball and my brother saw that I was going after it and we just started to play. And there happened to be the coach of the University of Charleston and she saw me play <laughs> and she told my caregiver, oh my God, she, he said, she said, I want her to come play for me on a scholarship. And that's why I'm here talking to you today. But I want to say something that if I would have listened to my caregiver and to the fact that my dreams were over, I wouldn't have played that day. I wouldn't be speaking with you today. What, what did, I'm going to ask, I have a question, but I, I have another one. Perth, <laughs> what did you do in that four to six months to, you, you were told it's over. What did you do to heal yourself? I was in a, how do you call those things that you put a over cast? your, a uh hat -huh, to hold your arm? Yeah, a cast. And or a sling. not a cast. It a was sling? a sling. sling? Uh -huh. And I remember it was so painful and I was just on that the whole time, but, but then I healed and I, I was just being a normal kid at the orphanage. I wasn't playing anything, but I was still hopeful. It was just the process of the, the healing part of it. So it was just your brain maintaining, yes. maintaining the hope, not giving in to what someone else said, but holding on to what you learned in the cave of, yes. of holding on to, to that space of what can be. Yes. Wow. And I'm, and I'm still surprised that, that I, that I got invited to play for college because it was so hard. That first time that I played basketball in West Virginia with my brothers, you have no idea. I mean, we're traveling in this Mexican bus, they call it Guajolotera, right? And uh, <laughs> every time we had breakfast, we would stop at a McDonald's and they would close it down because, well, first of all, they wouldn't believe us that we needed 150 Egg McMuffins, right? <laughs> and then they would close it down, but we were on the, eating that stuff and I felt so lethar lethargic and heavy i wasn't playing my best but that day but i still got the invitation and, yeah, I mean, and that whole story just amazes me you are on a tour um to raise funds for an orphanage 
And because of this tour, you get invited to play basketball for an American college. Yes. I, that's just, saying those words is mind blowing to me. Is it, is it still <laughs> mind blowing to you or is it, is it just like, no, this is how life works? No, I, I go back because I speak nationally and internationally and, and I always, when I tell my story, I always go back and see it very vividly. And I'm, I'm like, wow, you know, I'm so glad that I chose this, not that. Because I've, like my basketball coach in college, she pulled me aside one day and she learned about my story. And she says, oh my gosh, I need to talk to you. She says, how come you didn't end up in, on drugs, in jail and prostituting? You know, how, what, how did you do it? And the sad thing is a lot of the kids that I grew up with ended up that way. Mm. But you know, we all have that choice. We all have a choice to, our choices make our destiny really. And it's are, are how you, we think. Are you still in touch with any of the other children you grew up with? Yes, I am. But we are so much more closer with the biological kids mm -hmm. than ever. That, that's beautiful. So, okay, so now we have, is it four years of college or what, what's, what happens? Because we, we got to get to their salsa in our future, yeah. <laughs> but, but we're not there yet. So yes, how do we get there? So I went to college. I didn't know any English. There's nobody that spoke Spanish, so I learned it very well. I, how did, I how did, you learn? did you have an English teacher or did you figure out how to immerse yourself? No, I, I locked myself in a room for two years in the basement of my host family that took me from Mexico, from, you know, in West Virginia, from Mexico. And I would just watch TV a lot. And I was pronunciating what they were saying, repeating and repeating. And when I went to college, I always sat down an hour after every class to speak with my teachers. And they would try to explain with like signs and things until I learned it, until I got it. And I had a dictionary, Spanish English dictionary. So that's, it was very hard. <laughs> I can imagine. So, but you obviously learn, you, you, you get through college. Yes. What, what did you, what did you major in? So I majored in interior design and, uh, and I, I did play sports. I played sports on scholarships uh, for basketball. I ended up getting a scholarship for soccer, one for rowing crew and one for um, uh, running. And, uh, and I was so being able to play basketball. Wasn't enough for you. You, you just well, took over. <laughs> It, it wasn't that. It's just that when we just played with kids in college, they noticed me and they told the coaches. And so they came offering me money to play for their team. So that's how it, it evolved. But I went to college for five years. Actually, the last year I decided just to take it easier and just enjoy soccer. And I, in my degree, being in West Virginia, there was only two companies that were interior design you know, companies, and I went out and tried to get hired and I couldn't get hired by them. And so I just started sleeping out of my car. And um, this was right after, uh, during a winter, right after we got out of college. And I, that happened for a little while. And then, you know, West Virginia has a lot of hills. And I was driving one of these uphills one day and my engine blew up. And I didn't know anything about oil change or any, I mean, I didn't know any of that. I just, you know, came from Mexico and I just, uh, and so it was up on flames and I just picked up my bags and started walking. I, I left the car behind and I started sleeping in the woods and just going to the streets once in a while. But to me, it was sort of like an adventure because I, I, I really didn't even consider that I was homeless until I started my, my company and one of the people that was at a grocery store buying something and I was delivering products, she's like, oh my gosh, I, I remember you used to be homeless. I'm the one that got you rescued you from the street. And I was like, oh my gosh, I was homeless. And I was, I was like, okay. <laughs> what did you think you were doing? I just thought that I was in the woods and you know, I was doing my little fort. West Virginia has a lot of woodsy area. And nobody can find you really, if you really go in deep. And what I did to survive was I had ramen noodles. I think I paid like 30 cents or something per cup. And I would pretend like I was a customer at a gas station and put water in the ramen noodles and put in a microwave and then 
that's how I live, wh- how I lived um, uh, with, with that. And, but what happened was when this person got me out of the street, she gave me a place to stay. And about five to six weeks later, I got entered into a salsa contest for the state of West Virginia. And the reason why is because when I was in college, I was making this fresh pico de gallo salsa. And I was sharing it with friends and they loved it so much that they would tell my teachers and my teachers would have me bring it to class. So it was very popular in college. And so some of my friends entered me into the salsa comp- uh, contest and I didn't even know it. Wait, so you didn't even, okay. I have to take this a step back though. Um, how, how did she find you and take you out of, not, not off the streets, but out of the woods? Like I was, I was. I was sitting on a on a street side with my bags and I obviously look homeless. And she was walking by and I didn't know that who she was because I, my head was down and she came up and she says, oh, my gosh, what are you doing? Why, what's going on? Why are you here? She was a cook at the University of Charleston, by the way, when they honored me with the uh, Hall of Fame. So did I she got know her, you? Yes. From school? She knew okay. me from the university. She was a cook got there. It. And she got to be with me during that. I, I requested her to be with me to to kind of honor her when they gave me the 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 Hall of Fame uh, for the University of Charleston. And she's actually on the video too, also that I mentioned earlier, and in my book. Wow! So so she sees you there, takes you into her home. Then, mm-hmm. no, and- not not her home. She got me a place to stay at the university because the dorms were empty. Got it. And then unbeknownst to you, you get entered into a salsa contest. Yes. Yes. <laughs> what, what did you say when you found out you were entered? I, I was like a little shocked because I'd never been in a competition like that before. And I remember going to that market because it was in the capital market of West Virginia. And I will remember walking these mar- this market and saying, oh my gosh, it's real. Like it's right there. It happens this Saturday. What am I like, what am I going to do? And I'm like, well, I'll just make salsa. So I brought my stuff fresh because I, I brought some that was already made. Luckily, I'm so glad that I did that. And then I, and then I made, and I brought produce to make it fresh there live. And that's something that nobody else did. I, there was about uh, 15 con- uh, contestants and they all brought a uh, canned jarred salsa, which is totally different taste than a fresh, fresh, fresh pico de gallo salsa with a little lime. So you made vinegar. it live in front of everybody. Yes. Wow. And then yes. you, w- and then you win. So there was two, uh, two contests. One was, where the people vote and one where it was where the judges vote. And I both, I, I won both of those un- unanimously. And then I thought that I had, uh, that was my aha moment. Okay, maybe I do have something. Here's an opportunity. I'm just going to take it. But the challenge was that I was, well, I was serving salsa and talking to people that are like, oh my gosh, where do you sell this? Where can we buy it? People were like asking for it. And I'm, and I was saying, I, I, don't sell it. I don't, I, you know, I, I just came out of the streets and there's this guy that was looking at me. It was in a business suit. You know, when you notice somebody that's really staring at you and you can feel that energy. And I was ignoring it until after everything died down and he came over and I was like, okay. Um, and he came over and he said, I, I can see that you have a passion for this. And I've been hearing you talk to these people. And he said, I'm going to give you something in one condition that someday you will pay it forward. And I'm so sorry. I would never be sorry for tears. Tears are beautiful. And he, uh, thank you. He pulled out a wallet from his, uh, his pocket and he pulled out 800 bucks and he said, here's $800, but one day I would like you to pay it forward. And that was the best $800 that I ever spent to grow my company that made it a multi-million dollar success. And the beautiful thing is he didn't even want to give me his name. 
So you don't know who, who it was? No. Wow. Mm -hmm. And so I started my company. I, I, I First thing I bought was a little processor, food processor. And I started making salsa. I bought plastic containers and labels. And I started selling it by for the uh, $5 uh, per pint to my friends. And I remember I had a really thick stack of $1 and $5 bills. And I was like, woohoo, I'm a millionaire. <laughs> <laughs> and I just started growing the company and growing it and growing it. And the first place that took it was the market because they had tasted it. Mm. But, and I learned how to do everything. I got my truck driver's license. I this, you figure out how to do my website, my labels and everything. But my challenge was, you know, I had to get the product in people's mouths in order for them to make a decision. And so I made a long list of stores to call from the smallest to the largest in my mind. And one day I sat down and I started cold calling and it was so uh, nerve wracking. I was so afraid because I've never done that. And one after the other, after the other, I got hang up on, I got rejection. I got 90 rejections that day. And I sat down and I just put my phone down and I said, I'm just going to take a break. And at that time I was with somebody and they came in to where I was making calls and they're like, you're not making any money. You should just quit, get a job, you know, just quit. And so I just took the day off and I, um, decided that I, I must change the way that I'm doing this to see if something else works. So I took the next day, I took that list and turned it upside down. And now the largest organic retailer in the United States was at the very top, which was Whole Foods Market. And I was so, you have no idea, like I was so scared to call them. <laughs> so I got the voice message and I was like, thank God. And I got their voice message and I said, hey, my name is Maria Magdalena La Cruz Garcia. I have an awesome pico de gallo de salsa. I think you guys would love it. And I hang up and they called me, he called me, the head of the Mid-Atlantic region of Whole Foods called me the next day. It was 6 p.m. I was sitting on the, city, on the city center in my car and he asked me to come over to, and they, they met the next day, it was 6 p.m. They met the next day at uh, 9 a.m. and it was a trip from West Virginia to Maryland. So I had to go back to the kitchen, make salsa and drive up there. And I yeah. drove all night. Where, where were you living at the at this point? Were you still in in the college dorm or, or in the college dorm area, or where were you now? I, w I had gotten a, a one bedroom, teeny tiny apartment. Got it. So I had finally gotten a little place to stay. So you got a place, and you had your blender there, and yes. So you spent that night making salsa for the yes. morning meeting and drive over to Maryland. Yes. Okay. Yes. Wow. <laughs> so I, I drove up there and I remember barely making it on time and I was so scared. And I walked into this huge distribution center into this room and I had my salsa boxes with chips on top and I had my little heels and my little dress. And I walked into this place and it was a huge room and it was a huge U table and all the guys, they were all men sitting around the table on the outside. And I'm here in the center of this thing, just coming in and I'm like, oh my gosh. And so I just put the product down. I open the cases and I start passing containers and chips and they started eating it and eating it and eating it. Well, Eric gets up and he says, oh my gosh, your product is so good. When can we have it? And I said, well, how much do you need? And he says, well, your first order is going to be 10,000 pounds of salsa. Whoa. And I was like, oh my gosh. And at that time I was making about 250 pounds a week. And, um, and that, that was the difference between making that year, $12,000 to $1.9 million. Just so by changing one my... year. Yes. How, how, how did you make 10,000 pounds of salsa? <laughs> That's a really good question. It was me and another helper, and it took us a whole week to cut 10,000. Uh, that's uh, 60,000 tomatoes. Uh, and, and I had to figure out how to get like a bigger, one of those five gallon v, uh, VCMs to cut the tomatoes. And we barely made it. And but that's you, the you week. You still did it in this little one yes. bedroom apartment. 
Oh no, I had to quickly get um, a rent a kitchen that was FDA approved. Got it, got it. But the kitchen was an hour away. So I had to go up and make salsa after work because I had started a job to support myself with also doing this. And so I would travel one hour to make it and come back like at one in the morning or two in the morning and get up and go to work and do it every single day. And that's the week that I figured out that I needed team members. <laughs> you went from, well, let me ask you first. So, so you need team members. How, how many people did, did you bring onto your team? So I didn't know how to hire people. And I was asking around and I asked the small business, I think it was uh, small business administration. And I said, I need about 20 people to get this 10,000 uh, next order, you know, out because I was every week, 10,000 pounds of salsa. Every week. And okay. yes, yes. And so um, they said, oh, call the state. They have plenty of people. I said, great. So I called the state. I said, I need 20 people by, to, by tomorrow. Can, can I have them? I have this big order and I have this company and I was just explaining to them and they sent me exactly 20 people and I was like oh my god this is great and so I started we started working I got them into a room and I said hey guys my name is Maggie Cook I have this awesome pico de gallo de salsa Whole Foods wants it and it's it's amazing look it's fresh try it and I believe that I believe that I believe that we're going to become the largest salsa company fresh salsa company in the U.S. and you guys are going to help me take it and they're like, oh, you know, they're so excited. And we started production. I took them because I had a meeting. I didn't have meeting space. So I had a meeting at the at a business center. And then I drove them. We all drove back to the plant. And we started making salsa. And what happened was every day during break, we would break for half an hour to an hour. And I would buy them food. And we would discuss how to improve production every single day. Mm -hmm. And it was so awesome. One of those days. We were sitting outside in the rocks and I, we were just talking. Everybody was enthusiastic and we we're getting ready to go back and making more salsa. And it was an African-American guy and he stayed behind and I said, what's up? He says, Maggie, I just wanted to tell you, thank you so much for hiring me. Nobody else would hire me. I just came from prison and I did this, this and that. And I was like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, I don't want to. No, 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 no. I don't want to. You know, you're awesome. Let's just go back and work. Like you're, you're just awesome. So I called the state. And they provided me with all people from jail, from work release, and so on that I had to go back. And people asked me, how is that possible? You know, how the thing is, I married them to my why. Why is it that I'm doing what I'm doing and who I wanted to become? They were the best working people I've ever had. Wow. And what really stands out too about that is you said every, every day you tried to figure out how to make it better because yes. most of us get stuck in our you know this is what we're doing now and we get so stuck in it and we just keep doing and doing and doing but you actually yes. had to pause every day how do we make this better yes that's really powerful mm -hmm. so okay so you go from in one year you're making twelve thousand dollars to one point something million 1. Now, 9. Mo most of us go from okay if we're making twelve thousand, you know we'll make 50 and then 100 and then 150 and then 200 we, we we grow over the years what is it like to to make such a large transition in such a short period of time like that that's it's kind of a shock to the system i would think yes what, yes. what was that like it was really tough because I never expected that type of growth. The reason why we got the young, uh, small young entrepreneur of the year award is because we grew 500% that one year. And it was, I, I didn't expect that much success, but I made it happen. I made the little uh, deliveries happen. I made the production improvements, manufacturing processes, learning everything happen. And so it doesn't matter. It didn't matter how hard it was. I, I remember sleeping on a sack of beans. Well, because I was so tired. Well, they made salsa, and I would I would drive this. I got my truck drivers. I would drive this truck to um, Maryland every week for eight hours, and it was so slow because it was, there's a lot of hills in West Virginia. And so I I did whatever it took. You know, whatever it took. There's one story that I'll tell you. The very first truck that I drove, it was a 27 footer refrigerated truck. 
And I was looking for a truck for a whole week. I couldn't find the truck. Couldn't find it. Finally, I went to the salvage place and and I found the truck. But it was the oldest, rustiest, worse than a Mexican truck I've ever seen in my life. There's these wires and like so many wires sticking out of the dashboard, and the seat wouldn't adjust adjust because it was so rusted. So when I drove it, it would squeak, and it was a standard, and you couldn't see the numbers, like first gear, second gear. So when I got it, I, I rented it for $350. And I remember that I had to like test the gears to make sure that I knew, thank God I knew how to do that in Mexico, right? <laughs> <laughs> and so I drove to the, to the truck, to the plant, to the, the kitchen, and I packed it front to back all the way to the top. And I get on the road and I'm so excited. I'm jumping in the seat with joy. You know, the, the seat is squeaking. And I come to the first light. And the first light is a hill and I'm the first truck in a steep hill. And I realized I'm five foot two and now my butt is to the back of the seat and I can't reach the pedals. So imagine me trying to pull myself with one hand, one wheel, the other one with the shifter and the, the, my feet trying to reach the, 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 the brake was kind of up, you know, but trying to reach the clutch in the accelerator. I was, I was, I went into a sweating agony so quickly because I thought I'm going to hit the car behind me and I'm not going to be able to get this truck out of this hill. But I jerked this truck up this hill and it took forever <laughs> <laughs> And I got it out of the hill and I parked it to the side of the road. And I said, okay, whew, you know, I need to regroup. So I got out of the truck and I started saying to myself, I made it this far. I made it. I, I you know, I can't stop now. Like I got, you know, $40,000 worth of product in the back of this truck. I, I you know, I, I can do this. And what am I going to do? So what am I going to do? So I started looking around and ahead of me on the road uh, off the you know the gravel off the side of the road there was a piece of wood block and i noticed that that i had taped the the right mirror of the truck because it was falling off i had bought duct tape so i ran into the truck and i grabbed that duct tape and duct taped that piece of wood block on my foot and i could reach the pedal <laughs> and i drove to maryland that way but the, the funny thing to me, and it was very embarrassing at first, but then I got used to it, was that the truck had a leak in the gas tank. And I had to stop a lot in the gas stations. And you don't park this where the cars, you park this where the truckers are because it's a diesel truck. And it's a big truck. So every time I put gas on that, I got to go in and pay. And I had this piece of wood block. And people were looking at me so funny. These truck drivers <laughs> were looking at me so funny. At, at one point, I just owned it, and I was just so happy. I remember arriving to Whole Foods, and the, you know how they have the forklifts going to the truck, and it's yeah. pushing it up and down. And I was just so joyful and, and like screaming, "I made it! I made it! I made it!" First delivery, and then really the the rest was history from there. Wow, it just that is an amazing story on so many levels. One is that the CEO of the company is driving the truck. <laughs> you got the truck. Oh my God, there, there is just so much in, in that story. But now I'm curious, so that was your first delivery. You had $40,000 of product in there. How, how did you get the money to make the product in the first place? Because did, did, Whole Foods, to my understanding, they don't usually pay up front, they pay after they get it. So how did you right. make that work out? I love your questions because they are right on. And the, here's the one thing that people don't realize, you know, we think that we're failing because we don't have resources and we don't have the people or the money, but all the resources that we have are within us if we figure out a way. And my, one of my, my other bigger challenges was that when I went to the banks, they wouldn't loan me money because I had nothing to show for. And I was so angry at them, but I know now that they had all the right to be angry because I had nothing to show for. I was a liability. And so I, decided how am I going to produce I had get the money to produce this. And so I asked Whole Foods, I went to Whole Foods and I said, would you like give me a document that says that you will pay me in a week so that I can get the funds? And they said, absolutely. It's called a contract. And so they get, I signed the contract and I went to 
different types of people, friends that I knew. Um, and I said, look, look, I need $20,000 for cost of goods. Will you give me, will you let me borrow 20,000 in a week? I'll pay you back and then some. And they said, yes. And so I quickly bought everything that I needed. First week I made 40 grand. Next week I paid them back. Then every week was $40,000 just for that, that supermarket. And then what happened was amazing because now that I was in Whole Foods, all the stores that I was calling before that said no, started to call me. Wow. And that's really how the company grew. And so how long, I, I know that you then ended up selling the company. How long did you have the company before you sold it? So I had the company for about 10 years and it really grew very, very quickly. We moved into a, our own little kitchen place. It was an old KFC. Uh, and then we moved into a 20,000 square foot facility, two floors and a lot of production space. Uh, and then Walmart called. And uh, so now we're supplying to Walmarts and Costco's and Sam's and it grew so quickly. And then we sold it in 2015. It sold with Garden Fresh for 231 million to Campbell Soup. What was, um, did, did they call, how, how did that work? Did, did you, were you ready to sell and you're looking for a buyer? Did they call you? How did that work? Well, I've always known that my company was just a stepping stone for something bigger. Uh, my true purpose, my calling is to really help people in their suffering, whether it's in business or personal. And I've always wanted to do that, but I was not going to fall short of that opportunity. And I ran across uh, Garden Fresh on a food trade show, and I purposely bought a booth that was next to theirs. <laughs> and we became very good friends. And uh, Jack Aronson came to me after the show and he says, you remind me so much of my wife. Um, it's so nice to meet you. I was like, I guess that's a good thing. And then we just became such good friends. And, and that's, that's really how it all happened from that relationship. And when you, I know a lot of, a lot of people that sell their companies begin to, um, it's kind of like an identity crisis because they're, they're so their company becomes it's an identity baby. and when they don't have it, um, who, who am I? Like, like what, what, what am I now? Um, and, and I've worked with these people and I've coached these people. So what, what was, what was your transition from someone who built this from scratch? It is your baby. And, and mm -hmm. now it's someone else's baby and you're here with a lot of money, but no company. Mm -hmm. Well, sometimes it's good to let go, to allow bigger and greater things to come into your life so you can live a truly fulfilled, purposeful life. And I had no problems with letting go. It, is, it, does, it, it, does it maintain the same brand now? Is it still out there on the shelves with the same brand? I get calls and messages from time to time from the people that I, because we moved everything from West Virginia to Michigan. And they tell me that they're still making it. Uh, however, they, when they bought it, they were trying to get into supermarkets. I think they branded my products to go into other supermarkets with their own name because I was already in different supermarkets. So I'm not exactly sure what they're doing now. Uh, but so yeah. They're unattached to it. That, that was that. Right. that you, it's not like you walk by the supermarket and go, oh, there's, there's my old product. That, that, it's just history now for you. Right. Yes. So, you know, you shared with us, you know, your mission of, of helping people. So what, what is your, what is today for you? So today, what I do is I speak nationally, internationally, and I'm also a business strategist, a, a coach, and I help entrepreneurs grow their businesses, their brands. Um, and, you know, I'm at the place where there's people at a place where I was, they didn't, couldn't get help or didn't know how to grow. Uh, and I help them grow quickly using the tips, uh, tricks, and strategies that I used to grow my company. Now that I know them, uh, the shortcuts to get a lot more done in less time with uh, less money uh, and just the, the experience that I have is what I teach. Hmm. Uh, I'm drawn to, to the person that gave you $800 and saying to you, um, and you don't even know who he is, so you can't even go and thank him. 
uh, and him saying, pay it forward. So how do you, yes. how do you do that now? So I've been pay, I, I've been doing my best to pay it forward ever since, uh, I started my company since I became a little bit successful. And whenever I had or get entrepreneurs come to me asking for help and they have something really good and they said, well, I don't have the funds to make this happen. What I've done is in the past, I started uh, paying it forward with $800. But then as the, as the inflation has gone up a little bit, I've kind of adjusted for that. And I've helped people many in the many different industries, uh, hairstyling, shampoos, uh, um, uh, authors, speakers, uh, barbecue sauce companies. Uh, so different, different entrepreneurs with, you know, starting out like I was starting up. Wow. So, so you help people with the tips that you kind of figure you didn't know any of these, but you learned a lot in that cave and it gave you the resilience. So for people who are listening to that have, have this nascent idea for business, can you give us a couple of these shortcuts as you, as you call them? What, what can, what can we do today that will help us get quicker to, to that goal of a, a successful business while keeping a successful life? Let's remember that we need the successful mm -hmm. life side too. So can mm -hmm. you give us a tip or two? Well, there's so many, but I can tell you that the first thing that you need to think about is why are you alive? Why are you here? What is the purpose? What's the reason? There's, it's not an accident. If you are living a life of in this journey of living on autopilot just because you're doing something to make money and just live like everybody else and not living to your fullest, truest potential, your purpose, then are you really living? So why are you alive today? What is it that you're here for? So I help people discovering, rediscovering their why, because sometimes we get distracted. Even in our own businesses, we get out of purpose. And um, so really discovering your inner hero, rediscovering your why. Uh, and I teach uh, strategies on um, something called the surrender list, where I was so big on to-do lists and they took all my time. And it's basically a time-saving system where you can do in one year, well, most people get done in 10, <laughs> seriously, and how to do the techniques to have implement them for yourself and then your team, because when I implemented them for my team, they were very resistant until they apply them like, oh my gosh, they live by them. Wait, so you turned so the to-do list into a surrender list? It's called the surrender list, but it also applies the 80-20 rule on it. And that's one of the concepts that I teach. So what, what does that mean? Now, now you got, you got to tell me more now what you don't have to give me the whole thing, but, but what, what, what's the surrender list? So the surrender list has three components. You either delegate, you automate, or you eliminate. Mm. And you have to be willing to, as entrepreneurs, especially starting out, you think that you can do everything because you can do it best or you can do it uh, to save money and you don't trust other people but it's so important the growth is so important to your success in your business that you have to be willing to train people well one of the one of the other things that i teach is hiring the very best and i hire based on certain principles because when you hire on certain principles then you hire people that are like you with your energy that have the same interests and now you can delegate these things i love that I've never yes. heard the surrender list before. I love that. Delegate, automate, or eliminate. That's yes. huge. Uh, I, have, I have one more question. Uh, and I, this has been such a great conversation. I'm so grateful for, for our time together. Um, that knife next to you. Yes. Uh, and you've shown it to me before. So you, that, that means a lot to you, uh, I, I imagine, because it's right there next to you. Um, yes. what do you, why do you keep it? What do you experience when you see it, hold it? Flashbacks, flashbacks of using it for everything. <laughs> Never lost it. It got taken away by my caregiver because I killed a bird with it, but he gave it back to me many years later when I was in college. Uh, but it's seen as it's better days and I take it with me when I speak 
obviously locally, because if I fly with it, I might get in trouble. <laughs> but uh, I call it resourcefulness. It's a resource. I had to eat. I didn't starve to death. I didn't, you know, nothing happened. But this was a resource. What kind of resource or how can you be resourceful? How can you be resilient? How could you be relentless? And these are the three important cues that every entrepreneur needs in order to, to succeed, especially in these times. Thank you so much. If people do want to reach out to you, learn more. Uh, I know there's gomaggy.com, but uh, uh, and we'll put that link there. Any, anywhere else you want people to, to find you? If, they, if people want to see me speaking on stages or seeing what I do with coaching, they can go to maggiecook.com. That's Maggie with one G. And you'll remember because it's unique, right? Yeah. <laughs> MaggieCook.com. And then you can find me on social media and on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter. Uh, I'm pretty much everywhere. So that's, that's how you can find me. And then if you want to have a chat with me, you can go to call with Maggie. Again, Maggie with one G. Callwithmaggie.com. And we can schedule a time to talk. Well, thank you so, so much, Maggie. I have learned so much from you. And, you know, for those watching, listening, if there was ever any doubt in your mind that you could do it from orphanage to, to in the woods slash homeless, but not even thinking you're homeless, to um, making salsa and selling a huge company, if you ever had any doubt that you can do it, I, I hope this convinces you that there is always a way. Um, thank you, Maggie, for sharing with us. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you for having me. We'll see everybody next time. Please remember, you are loved. <laughs>